everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. We are back. So welcome to the European Fertility Society. Welcome to My Abbey Fences. We are ready to talk about uh, difficult, interesting, and of course, a very, very important topic tonight. As you know, this is the effect of endometriosis and its IVF outcome. And we have our uh, special guest, our expert, fertility expert, Dr. S Dr. Elias Sakas is with us. Hello, Dr. Sakas. Welcome back. Uh, it's great to have you. This is your first webinar this year, but of course, we had many, many webinars um, before, so I'm glad that you are back with this particular topic. You already said to me that it took you a while to pre prepare this uh, presentation, so I'm really looking forward to see what you have prepared. How are you feeling tonight? Hi, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, hi, Caroline. I'm feeling absolutely fine. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you tonight, and uh, this is one of my favorite subjects because it's a cross between um, my two uh, passions. One is uh, um, endometriosis and its uh, awareness and management, in particular with regards to minimal access and minimal invasive solutions. And of course, fertility and IVF. So thank you so much for the opportunity. We are definitely ha happy to have you back as our expert. And tonight, as we mentioned, we will start with uh, Dr. Tsakos' presentation. Let me just add that he's the medical director of Embro Clinic, which is located in Thess Thessaloniki. And uh, well, I think we can go ahead with your presentation. And afterwards, remember, there will be time for your questions. Please type those in the chat. Uh, Dr. Tsakos will uh, surely answer them for you right after his presentation. Um, yeah, so don't hesitate. This is your time. Remember, it's all anonymous. This is also being recorded. So if I hope not, but if you need to leave or you will miss any parts of this, don't worry. It's going to be actually updated, uh, uploaded on our website as well tomorrow. So uh, stay tuned. Let's go ahead with our presentation. Dr. Tsakos, are you ready? Yes, I am. Yes. Glad Thank to hear you. this then. Let's go. Thank you again. I understand some of you might be um, very tired after a long day, so I will try to be brief and sweet, but at the same time, I will try to cover the subject, which is um, fairly extensive. The, the perspective I will give you is the endometriosis in relation with uh, fertility. So uh, I will just go ahead. So endometriosis in general, I will give you an overview. Endometriosis and fertility effect of endometriosis on IVF, and of course, what are the treatment options uh, with the perspective of um, enhancing and uh, advancing fertility. So, a quick overview. What is endometriosis? This is uh, the condition in which endometrial tissue, which is tissue from the lining of the uterus. Uh, can you see my, uh, my pointer, Caroline? Yes, you can. Okay. Yes, I can. Uh, All is okay. So uh, this is the lining of the uterus here. And in endometriosis, we have ectopic location of, of the lining, either in the tubes, on the ovaries, on the, um, on, on, on the uterus, around the uterus, ovaries, and tubes, in the peritoneum, in the intestines or the bladder, and sometimes in remote areas as well, which may include, but not limited to, the diaphragm, the chest, surgical scars, so situations in which uh, following a laparoscopy or, or an open operation or even a cesarean section, there's endometriosis tissue found on those scars. And it has been described even on the eyelids, which is quite astonishing. And of course, the appearance of those, uh, the presence of those um, um, cells and, and that tissue in ectopic sites may be associated with small bleeding areas in those areas. And of course, associated with inflammation and fibrosis, which is scar tissue. And as a consequence, women may experience variable symptoms, which include uh, pain, but also other symptoms, and also infertility. I will refer to those a little bit later. How common is endometriosis? I mean, the usual answer we get from our women when we, when we mention the possibility of, uh, of them suffering from endometriosis is endo what? So it's a Greek word coming from endo, which is the, the um, 
uh, the inside and metriosis, what's inside the uterus uh, in an ectopic site, in a site which is not supposed uh, uh, to have endometrial tissue. So this affects about 10% of women. That's a lot of women. That's very common. Overall, it has been estimated that about 200 million women in the world suffer from endometriosis. It's mainly affecting women of a productive age, although it may be found in women older than 50 or 60 years old. Uh, the commonest uh, ages um, affected by endometriosis is between 30 and 40. And there's a usually delayed diagnosis by plus or minus seven years. So you have women, we have women with um, symptoms um, presenting to various doctors, symptoms of endometriosis. However, the, the, the diagnosis could be delayed up to seven years, sometimes longer. Here we have a very nice map uh, that we found in the literature, my team and I, uh, which show that Endometriosis, um, in line with fibroids, as you probably know, are commoner in, uh, in Africa or in Africa, uh, in the African race. Uh, they're also very common, even commoner in Asia, the Americas and Europe. So you can see that they can be, you know, quite commonly found in those areas. And here you can see a graph of uh, the age dis distribution of endometriosis. And of course, the commonest is 30 to 40. Uh, but given given the fact that the diagnosis could be delayed up to seven years, uh, you may understand that uh, the disease may have started much earlier, and it, it's only diagnosed uh, in in those uh, in those age groups between 20 and 40. What are the clinical symptoms? 85% uh, present with tiredness and low energy, so with no particular um, no particular reason, uh, women and young girls, they feel tired. Uh, a vast, vast majority also have abdominal pain, so pain somewhere in the abdomen. About 78% they present with painful periods, this is dysmenorrhea. 78% with pelvic pain, so pain down, down, down into the lower part of the abdomen. 75% presenting with back pain. So I've had lots of cases referred to me by, by fellow orthopedic surgeons or osteopaths uh, who had um, young women and young girls presenting with back pain uh, with no particular uh, orthopedic or osteopathic um, issues. And thankfully, those uh, colleagues of mine suspected the possibility of endometriosis, a diagnosis which was confirmed and ab abdominal bloating. So as you can see here, the vast majority present with some sort of pain together with tiredness. And why? Because of the chronic inflammation and the chronic pain. Having said that, additional common symptoms may include painful intercourse, painful uh, passage of stools, and painful urination. So you can think of, of, of that inflammation and that irritation affecting uh, the vast majority of, of organs. So what about infertility? Endometriosis is associated with infertility in about 30 to 50 percent of women. So uh, when we have infertility, whether there's um, known or unknown or, or idiopathic infertility, the chance of coexisting endometriosis is pretty high. So it's on average five times higher than the general population. So this is something to, uh, to, to be aware of. And of course, this sometimes is related with no symptoms other than infertility of endometriosis. So how does endometriosis affect fertility? And this is uh, my favorite slide. Firstly, through the fallopian tubes, through affecting the fallopian tubes. So endometriosis on the fallopian tube may have an, a direct effect on the epithelium, which is the lining of the tube, and may also have indirect effect via adhesions or hydrosalpinges. So the tube is a very fine organ. It can be easily affected by endometriosis. Local inflammation and scarring tissue may cause damage of that tube, and that tube doesn't, doesn't work effectively. 
Uh, also, there may be a direct effect on the ovaries. So the ovaries produce the follicles, the follicles produce the, the eggs. So there's, um, there's impaired uh, production of follicles, folliculogenesis, and that affects the follicular growth rate, and that affects the dominant follicle size. And also there's a different mechanism in the literature which is related to oxidative stress, uh, which is uh, again causing impairment of oocytes. Now there's also another effect which is on the actual uterus itself, uh, which affects the implantation of the embryo. And this may be due to either delayed cellular maturation, due to biochemical changes or reduced uh, protein expression on, on the uterus. And of course, there may be, which is a very interesting, effect on the sperm, on the sperm integrity and sperm function. So all of this may affect fertility in more ways than one. So how does endometriosis affect the outcome of assisted reproduction of IVF or ICSI? Firstly, it decreases the implantation rate. So there we are, we have, we may have a woman in, in her mid-30s suffering from endometriosis that may or may not have been diagnosed uh, before the fertility issue. And we decide to proceed with IVF. That patient, that couple, they need to be aware that, uh, that they have 16% lower implantation rate. This 50% lower number of uh, eggs retrieved uh, from that woman with endometriosis. And why? Because of those effects on, uh, on the ovarian production that I, I mentioned before. And of course, uh, another adverse effect is the multiple pregnancy rate, which is an indirect effect. So we have an endometriosis patient. We're, we're very well aware of the low implantation rate and the, and the lower number of oocytes retrieved. So in order to overcorrect that, uh, we, we implant two embryos and, of course, uh, the chance of multiple pregnancy and its complication is, is therefore or may be higher. And, of course, through to the effect on the tubes and on the embryo uh, implantation, there's a 16% chance of uh, ectopic pregnancy rate, higher uh, than 16% chance higher than than compared to women with no endometriosis. So in more ways than one, endometriosis not only does it affect fertility, but also the outcome of um, IVF. So what are the pregnancy outcomes? So, you know, we diagnosed endometriosis, we, 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 we challenge that by performing IVF or by performing surgery. So what happens, or both? So what happens with pregnancy? As you can see here, and this is a very useful slide for our fellow uh, obstetricians, for, for our colleagues and for our teams uh, who manage uh, pregnancies as well. And um, this is a very valuable slide that uh, I actually uh, discuss with my obstetric team as well, because we manage our own pregnancies at Embryo Clinic as well. So placenta previa rates. So placenta previa is when the placenta is actually implanted uh, lower, very close to the... Um, uh, to, to the lower part of the uterus, sometimes blocking the, um, the endocervical os, the endocervical canal, and that may be associated with um, complications of pregnancy and complications of delivery in relation to bleeding. So three times higher chance of placenta previa, so abnormal, abnormal location of the placenta. And of course, 20, this, this directly or indirectly may be affecting the chance of bleeding after pregnant, after delivery, um, up to 25% higher bleeding rates. Thankfully, there's no significant differences in live birth rate, in low birth weight rates, and in neonatal complications. So uh, take home message, placentation and bleeding problems, but if we're aware of those, we can thankfully and hopefully manage them in a way that doesn't affect uh, overall the morbidity of the mother or the baby. So what are the, what are the treatment modalities we can discuss, we can um, choose when we're treating endometriosis in the context of fertility? Now, endometriosis is a challenging disease and its treatment is even more challenging 
even more so in fertility patients. So what are the aims? The aims are to achieve a balance between preservation and enhancement of fertility and also alleviation of symptoms. So we don't want to do radical surgery. However, we want to do effective surgery, for example, plus or minus effective medical management. And of course, at the same time, we want to alleviate um, the symptoms. Uh, there's a term I heard uh, recently, which I, I, I'm probably going to use as well myself. We want to be conservatively radical in our surgery. That's a very interesting term. So what are the factors determining endometriosis and fertility decisions in terms of uh, treatment? I mean, firstly, the patient's age and the patient's physical condition. Uh, these are very important determining factors. So for a young patient, we would, uh, we would try to preserve their fertility. If, um, if they're not planning to have a family yet, we would probably consider uh, ovarian uh, and oocyte um, cryopreservation. Uh, perhaps we would use surgery in com combination with uh, medical management uh, for symptomatic patients. Uh, please remember that management of endometriosis requires a multidisciplinary team. No gynecologist by themselves is good enough or should be good enough to, to treat endometriosis. We should have a multidisciplinary team uh, uh, in, the, in a similar fashion that um, we do in oncology patients. And that team should definitely include a specialist gynecologist, a fertility gynecologist, a minimal access gynecologist and preferably a robotic surgery, a robotic surgeon as well, an imaging specialist, MRI and ultrasound specialist, pain management specialist, whether the um, anesthetist, pain specialist, nurse specialist, and so forth. Certainly a liaison person, a psychologist, colorectal surgeons, urinary surgeons, and of course, uh, the facilities that offer all the options, including very complex surgery and the latest advent in that is robotic surgery, as I will, um, I will mention later on in my talk. And of course, a very good, a very good knowledge of up-to-date uh, treatment management in, term, in terms of hormonal manipulation and also pain management. Now, the extent and the severity of the disease is very important because on one hand, we wish to alleviate the symptoms and improve the quality of life of a patient. And on the other hand, we want to um, enhance the fertility, preserve the fertility, promote the fertility, uh, promote the chance of pregnancies either now or in the future. Of course, additional infertility factors are important. Uh, we recently treated a very complex case uh, with, uh, with um, um, endometriosis, uh, deep endometriosis, ovarian endometriosis, uh, together with, uh, with the hugely myomatous uh, uterus, and then uh, also in, in a couple uh, in whom uh, there was also semen problems, problems. So that was a very challenging case. And again, we have to think over and over and over again before we set out a, a management plan, and the patients have to be part of that equation and part of the discussion in terms of the various option. I mean, there's hardly ever just the one option. And it's very important to take into account the patient characteristics and the patient wishes uh, before we, 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 we proceed with, um, with, the, with the plan and with the management um, decision. And of course, the severity of pain is very important. I mean, I've had lots of patients who said, doctor, yes, I do want to become a mother. I do want to preserve my fertility but I want to keep my sanity, so please take my pain away. So uh, again, we keep this in mind when we decide how to, to, how to manage and how to prioritize the management of, of, of those patients. Uh, please think that uh, endometriosis is a chronic disease. It's a disease that locally is, is perhaps, if not more invasive, if not more aggressive, it's definitely as invasive and as, uh, as aggressive than cancer. Um, and sometimes the damage it produces locally is, is much worse than, than early stages of cancer. And of course, the surgery involved in endometriosis can be much worse than, 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 than the majority of, of cancer cases and so forth, 
And why is that? Because we're talking about usually neglected cases, about cases in which the diagnosis has been delayed by an average of seven years. We're talking about major local inflammation, major organ damage. And of course, when, when, we're, when we're dealing with those patients, we're usually dealing with younger patients, with uh, active patients, with, with, with women who've suffered for many years and who wish to, to go back on their feet, get on with their life, get on with their personal and professional lives and social lives, and at the same time wishing to, to attend their fertility. So the challenge there is huge and the responsibility is also massive. Now, what are, uh, what are the available, sorry, the, the available uh, treatment options. So medical treatment, surgical treatment, fertility treatment, and new treatments. This is what I'm going to briefly talk about. So, sorry about this, my, my mouse is very fast tonight. So medical treatment, uh, various types of hormonal manipulation, ovarian suppression, down regulation, oil contraceptives but, uh, of various types, and anti inflammatory and antioxidant agents as uh, add-ons, usually not by themselves, uh, due to the um, uncertain outcomes. These are the wonderful team of my lab. And of course, the fertility treatment options, they include a very thorough pre-IVF testing and fertility counseling with guidance, counseling and testing assessment, and also the, the formation of, of, a, of a fertility plan together with, uh, with our patients. IVF and ICSI, which has to be individualized uh, depending on, on particular circumstances. Um, sometimes oocyte or embryo donation may be the way forward if uh, we're dealing with patients of advanced reproductive age with multiple perhaps failed IVFs with very low ovarian reserve, with, um, with uh, multiple previous surgeries uh, that have failed and so forth. And of course, there's always the surrogacy uh, program option in case that uh, that the uterus is is damaged to an extent that uh, that it is felt through the multidisciplinary team uh, counseling that uh, that perhaps it's not advisable to proceed with implantation in the patient's uterus. Um, altruistic surrogacy is legal and regulated in Greece. Greece is amongst um, uh, the world class. Uh, uh, destinations for, um, for, for surrogacy. And um, sometimes a very clear indication of surrogacy is uh, adenomyosis or severe endometriosis affecting uh, the uterus. So surgical treatment uh, options include uh, minimal invasive solutions. I mean, this has been a huge advantage of the last maybe 20 to to 30 years, um, gynecologists have stopped performing uh, surgery through large uh, incisions, through laparotomy incisions, uh, with the advent of laparoscopy. Uh, up until maybe 10 years ago, uh, the laparoscopy was considered uh, the golden standard in uh, the management of endometriosis. And there's very good evidence that laparoscopic management, conventional or robotic laparoscopic management, may lead to 63% um, pregnancy rate improvement. Even in mild endometriosis, the surgical exc excision improves implantation and pregnancy rates. This is a very important point to remember, especially in cases uh, classified as unexplained infertility. So we have a we have a lady in her say late 30s. And, you know, she's healthy, um, tubal test is normal, um, ultrasound scans normal, hormonal test normal, sperm normal. You know, we give them the label of, um, of um, unexplained infertility or idiopathic infertility. The chance of this lady suffering from endometriosis, whether she has symptoms or not, is 30 to 50%. So maybe uh, that younger woman or women in the younger age group that may benefit from diagnostic laparoscopy is that we used to perform more liberally in the past. Uh, we're, not as, um, uh, we're not as liberal as now in using laparoscopy, uh, but I think we should probably consider, especially in cases that we suspect endometriosis in younger women, um, 
in, in whom uh, idiopathic infertility doesn't quite fit in with the overall clinical picture. And of course, the state-of-the-art surgical management for severe cases, at least for severe cases of endometriosis, uh, deep endometriosis, deep infiltrating endometriosis, uh, repeat surgery for recurrent endometriosis, um, advanced endometriosis as diagnosed by MRI scanning is robotic surgery. Now, this is the latest uh, um, robotic uh, surgery technology system. It's the latest available minimal invasive surgical option. It's providing surgeons with improved control, precise movement, safer excision of foci and minimal complications. Uh, there's 3D visualization and better detection. And of course, with robotic surgery and with experience, with, we can guarantee thorough excision, careful sparing and protection of healthy tissues, including reproductive organs and, of course, vessels and nerves. Um, sometimes robotic surgery is indeed absolutely invaluable in managing deep endometriosis. And uh, more and more centers in the world, in, including ours, uh, we, have, um, we have been offering uh, that uh, latest option with great success. I uh, will give you a very short video about um, robotic surgery. This has been generated by our team. So these are the um, these are the arms, the the four arms uh, that are inserted into the patient, and uh, of course those uh, very precise instruments. We offer our patients with the latest scientific technology. So the arms are inserted into, so I mean, robotic surgery is, uh, is a laparoscopic equipment. Even the most demanding gynecological surgery procedures are performed with a minimum amount of blood loss, pain, hospital stay, and recovery. So the surgeon is operating through this console and is controlling those arms which are directed into the tissue that we uh, we're operating on. So it's a, it's a fully integrated system, which is providing us uh, with, uh, with the best of all worlds, uh, both in terms of vision, but also in terms of uh, manipulation of tissues uh, with the accuracy of, of millimeter. So there's also emerging treatment options at the moment. Uh, many, some of them are experimental. However, they are promising. I'm gonna run through them. Uh, that includes um, molecular targets in gene expression, prostaglandin inhibitors, and stem cells. Now, what are the take-home messages uh, from this webinar? Firstly, endometriosis is very common. Uh, it's a very common condition with significant input, impact on quality of life and on fertility. It possesses a significant negative impact on IVF outcomes. So endometriosis uh, affects uh, negatively uh, fertility treatments. Treatment in the context of fertility may be quite challenging and treatment of endometriosis overall requires specialized centers and the multidisciplinary team. Optimal treatment is delivered by combination of surgical and fertility treatment. Robotic surgery is the latest available treatment modality and offers a safe and effective solution to endometriosis. And both surgical and fertility expertises are required for optimal management of endometriosis. Now, March is Endometriosis Awareness Month. So let us celebrate this month by increasing education and uh, awareness on endometriosis. Uh, these are some references from, uh, from the literature, some of them quite um, recent. So um, you're very free to look into those in order to get more information on specific subjects. And this is my team who backed me up during those hours that I prepared this presentation. I like to thank them, thank them for their support, and especially Dr. Manos Ksidias, who has been working side to side with me in order to prepare this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm free to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed for this brilliant presentation. You are very right. It was very interesting, lots of information, useful one. Um, so thanks so much for sharing for your time. And now um, this is time for the questions. So I do see some already, but of course, if you have any, 
go ahead. This is your time. Dr. Tsekas is right here for you. So let's go ahead and let's have a look at the first question. All right, so the question is from Liz. Um, does implantation rate and number of all sites retrieved decrease with age in women with endometriosis? Yeah, hi, Liz. Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, unfortunately, yes is the answer. Uh, I mean, basically think of endometriosis as a local inflammation factor that uh, is uh, chewing onto the oocytes and to, onto the ovaries. So with advanced age, we have um, two effects. One is the effect of age itself on the number and the quality of oocytes. And the other is the effect of, um, of endometriosis itself on the number and the quality of oocytes. Um, Additionally, unfortunately, endometriosis affects uh, IVF success uh, through other factors, and one of them is, uh, is the implantation factor affecting directly the quality of the, um, of the implantation through the uterine, through the effect on the uterus. Okay. Thank you, Liz, for the first question and your explanation. Uh, more questions are coming up, so let's have a look. Thank you for ta talking on this topic. You've mentioned oxidative stress. Would you recommend supplements, example, ubiquinol, to help? And should these be continued after the embryo transfer? Sure. Um, okay. Although, although it's identified that oxidative stress is one of the mechanisms to uh, the mechanisms through which endometriosis affects the ovaries, it's not quite clear whether whether the supplements may reverse that. So, you know, the, the, the jury is still out as to, to what is the usefulness of the supplements and to what extent and what supplements, how do we measure all that and so forth. So, it's unfortunately, it's not clear cut as to what we would expect. Um, in general, I would say it wouldn't harm, but I'm not sure exactly of any, of any, of any um, uh, defined protocol that uh, I would suggest. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, let's have a look. Liz has one more question. Can long-term use of hormonal birth control mask the symptoms of endometriosis? Yes, yes is the answer. Yes, unfortunately, yes. Um, the symptom, um, I use three terms. I don't know if I mentioned them. I'm, I'm, I have three favorite terms uh, for endometriosis, which I didn't, you know, as you as you do a presentation, you have to get all your knowledge and all your experience into uh, 20 slides. It's not easy. Uh, so let me let me give you my three um, examples and my three terms that I use. Uh, one is chameleon. I mean, unfortunately, endometriosis may may look like different things or different diseases in different women. Even in the same woman, it may present initially as uh, painful periods and then uh, painful periods may may disappear or may become a little bit easier and then uh, it may present as painful intercourse and then the pain may disappear altogether for some reason and then until it comes back again and so forth. Uh, so chameleon is one term I use. The second term I use is um, iceberg, which means that what you see above the surface is only a small proportion of what lies underneath the surface. And uh, this has uh, puzzled all of us, um, especially the one of us uh, dealing with both fertility and, uh, uh, and endometrial surgery. Uh, there are not that many of us around because, uh, uh, you know, being uh, specializing in fertility medicine and surgery has stopped becoming the norm uh, for more than 15, maybe 20 years now. Uh, so, um, you know, my generation and perhaps the previous to my generation, so probably the last of the Mohegans of, of doctors, gynecologists who've um, done IVF and done surgery at the same time. So uh, sometimes on the same patient, quite commonly on the same patient. Uh, and what we found, and many times we've been fooled, and um, this, this is something that we have to be aware of, is that, you know, you suspect endometriosis, you do a scan, you perhaps see a small cyst of endometriosis or a bigger cyst of endometriosis, and then you do a laparoscopy, you remove the cyst of endometriosis, and maybe you, you remove a couple of, uh, 
of, of spots of endometriosis outside the uterus on the peritoneum and then the patient recovers and then two months later uh, they come back with massive pains and massive symptoms and then you find out that you perhaps missed deeper endometriosis which was there so endometriosis can be there without us knowing sometimes the iceberg is above the surface sometimes it's not you know titanic think of titanic and then you crash on it and you only find out when you've crashed on it and when it's inevitable to sink and sometimes you you neglect perhaps um you know some signs on the mri some symptoms um, the child, you don't look hard enough to find areas of endometriosis when you do a laparoscopy because laparoscopy is the gold standard, but not for deep endometriosis because sometimes you don't see it or you see it and you don't recognize it because it's not always uh, red. It can be white and so forth. So it's very complicated. So chameleon, think of chameleon, think of iceberg and think of time bomb and time bomb. Uh, sometimes time bombs, they don't have a, um, a sound on the clock, so you can't hear the clock ticking. You can't hear the tick, 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 tick noise. It can be a silent time bomb. So someone may have endometriosis, mild, I mean, all women have occasional mild symptoms of uh, painful periods or, or period um, on inter or pain on intercourse or a little bit of painful um, uh, urination or occasional uh, bloatness or occasional fatigue um, and and then the bomb is sticking until it explodes and how does it explode by either massive symptoms like massive pains or bleeding or massive uh, acute episodes of uh, of um, of um, pain on intercourse that require hospitalization massive pain on on during um, um, uh, ovulation or none of that and just presenting with infertility you know they've had a you know fairly regular normal painless uh, periods and then they just present the fertility specialist with infertility you know doctor performs a scan may see or not see a small cyst that looked like an endometriosis cyst you know if somebody has taken the the, the pill you know, the pill, yes, masks the, some of the symptoms of endometriosis, sometimes all of them. And then suddenly, boom, the bomb explodes. And then they find out they have stage four endometriosis and have, they have a very low ovarian reserve. So I think the, 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 the meaning and the, the message from this webinar, and this is one of my passions. And I share that with a lot of wonderful people all over the world. Uh, and uh, we're very thankful to these people, foundations all over the world amazing amazing individuals who create foundations and support them day and night uh, and remind us as well as uh, patients uh, that endometriosis is there and it's hiding so we have to be at least aware of it brilliant thank you so much and there's a thank you from liz thank you so much for a detailed answer that's true thank you indeed um it's we definitely need to spread the words and uh, educate, educate. And that's why we are also here, of course, as well. Okay. Um, next question. Is endometriosis fed by estrogen only or progesterone also feeds it? Okay. Uh, well, um, I can't really answer this question. All, all I'm going to say is that basically what is endometriosis? I mean, you have the lining of the uterus which has specific tissue now when this tissue is anywhere else so it's normal within the uterus to have endometrial tissue and then every time a period comes on it bleeds and then it has been um it has been um there's a provision for that blood to come out uh, through the cervix and the vagina and that's it that's a period okay now if this line lining is anywhere else in a closed space that bleeding that period bleeding which is normal for the lining of the uterus is causing an internal bleed and you know we've all heard of the term internal bleed or somebody had a, an accident and there was internal bleeding so this is exactly what's happening in women with endometriosis they have small areas of internal bleeding which is not massive enough which is not big enough 
to, to threaten their lives in terms of blood loss, but it's big enough, it's, it's enough to cause local damage, local inflammation, local scarring, local pain, local um, effect on the, on, the, on the organ, if it's, uh, if it's the urinary system, the ureter, the bowel, um, you know, the diaphragm sometimes, and so forth. So this is what it is. So, uh, yeah, it's fed by it's fed by by both the hormones that cause that create periods, and that's why uh, either empirically or temporarily, or um, as part of of the overall approach and management and, and treatment of endometriosis, we may use uh, some sort of hormonal medication in order to stop the periods. I mean, I. I, I have quite a few women um, in, her, in their later productive years who've completed their family with, uh, with uh, deep endometriosis who have decided that they don't want, to, they don't want surgery. And uh, we try to stop their periods by hormonal manipulation and they're symptom free. So um, I don't know if I'll, I've answered your question, but generally um, perhaps the first um, reflex uh, treatment we can do for endometriosis and sometimes this is a diagnostic treatment diagnostic inverted commas if we're not sure about uh, the diagnosis if uh, if we're not sure based on imaging based on, on clinical symptoms based on our clinical um, hunch um, then perhaps if we yeah if we stop the periods if we manipulate the hormones and the symptoms of pain or other symptoms um, go away, then perhaps we have made some sort of diagnosis of potential endometriosis that has been treated. All right. Thank you so much for your question again. And let's have a look. A few questions left. So let's let's give it a... Um, this is the second one. Do you normally drain an endometrioma cyst before an IVF stimulation starts or not? What's the effect of endometrioma on IVF outcome? In your experience yeah hi you tuned in <laughs> thank you so much for the question i never drain an endometrioma i do not like to drain endometriomas uh, generally and especially in the context of ivf or imminent ivf and uh, why is that um firstly firstly when we see a cyst when we see let, let, let's see, a huge misconception is this, you know, we, 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 see a, we see a cyst on the ovary, we have very fancy, very good, very expensive scan machines, um, 3D scan, Doppler scan, all sorts, so we see a, an, an, an ovary with a cyst containing uh, blood, so it's a blood-filled cyst uh, that looks like an endometrioma, okay? So we label that endometrioma. The chance of this is being endometrioma is probably 50%. Because what we see on the scan is not an endometrioma. We see a cyst with blood in it. And unless we, we remove that, and unless we do biopsy on that, and unless we find on the biopsy endometrial tissue, we don't know if it's endometrioma or not. I mean, I operated on a, on a, on a wonderful lady last week. Uh, she was referred with a, a large endometrioma on the ovary, seven centimeters, distorting the ovary, pushing on the ureter, creating all sorts of bowel urinary symptoms, lots of pain. She had this label endometriosis uh, written all over her. You know, she could even, um, you know, it was even a flushing label. <laughs> and then I did a surgery. On surgery, yeah, it could be endometriosis. To cut the long story short, it wasn't. It was an ovarian cyst adenoma with bleeding in it. So we have we have to be very careful uh, with the label endometriosis. Equally careful with uh, with not identifying endometriosis when there's there. Uh, we shouldn't be quick in identifying endometriosis when when we see a cyst with blood. So for that reason, I don't drain it because it could be any kind of cyst. Secondly, if you see a cyst with old blood, usually if you try to drain it, I've tried that many times, of course, uh, in the past, and um, more often than not, you can't drain it because 
because the blood is clotted, so it doesn't come through the through the um, through the needle you put in. And then, of course, at the same time, because it's um, it's clotted blood, it's a perfect environment for infections to to develop. So, uh, if you stick a needle through the vagina, no matter how careful you are, and how, how no matter how uh, how 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 prophylactic antibiotics you give, how nicely you wash and all that, you have a fairly good chance of introducing infection. So that is that is a problem. So that's why I never drain them. And of course, um, never forget of cancer. Okay, so we see a cyst. It's a, it's a cyst with blood. Um, it's a cyst with blood um, in a 40-year-old woman. It has a moderately elevated CA1 to 5 marker. It could be cancer. The chance is low, but it, it can happen. So I never drain it. Drain it. Even if it is an endometrioma, I can see here Tumba saying that it's uh, confirmed through laparoscopy. Even, even if it is an endometrioma, I still don't drain it because, firstly, uh, it causes local inf inflammation. And as you know, IVF and fertility in embryos, they don't like inflammation. And secondly, the spillage of, uh, of endometrial tissue may cause further spillage of endometrial tissue in the peritoneum. So if I see a, a, a cyst, uh, a bloody cyst, an, an endometrioma uh, suspicion uh, on a cyst. In the context of IVF, I try to avoid it. I try not to puncture it if I can, and I try to avoid it. Now, now Yatumba said it's confirmed endometrioma through laparoscopy. Okay, listen to this now. Yes, you may have had endometrioma removed by laparoscopy, and that doesn't mean that the next cyst, the recurrence of that, is always an endometrioma. It's happened to me many times, and I'm sure most of the surgeons listening in, I can see some familiar names. Uh, they've been faced with that. You know, did an operation, uh, removed endometriomas, and then six months later or a year later, a lady comes back, sometimes a little bit angry and saying, doctor, you removed the endometrioma, it's come back. And then, yes, we scan the lady, we see a cyst filled with blood, we feel full of guilt, that perhaps something didn't quite happen as we wanted, we do a repeat surgery and the biopsy shows hemorrhagic corpus luteum or hemorrhagic cystadenoma. The fact that you've had endometrioma removed once doesn't mean that any cyst you will develop in the future is endometrioma. It could be another benign cyst, it could be endometrioma, touch wood, it could be something worse. I had this wonderful patient who, who we managed to deliver um, couple of children through IVF following the repeated surgery for stage 4 endometriosis and then a couple of years in her early 40s, couple of years after the birth of her second child, she had an, an, an ovarian cyst filled with blood, a little bit elevated, CA1 to 5. She didn't come to us because she thought it was a recurrence. She thought perhaps um, it wasn't really worth uh, getting another opinion. Uh, she was she was she was sat on you know people observed her they said it's endometrial she came back but you've had your your children you don't worry too much about the ovaries to cut a long story short it was cancer and uh, please don't forget that the recurrent endometriosis can always be cancer unfortunately unless proven otherwise and it is i didn't mention it in my slides but although there's a small possibility uh, there is an association with uh, with ovarian cancer endometriosis and ovarian cancer all right. Thank you for again explaining. And as you can see, so never assume it's endometriosis. Yeah. Never mm -hmm. assume. Yes, it is likely to be endometriosis if it has certain characteristics. It is likely to be endometriosis if it's a recurrent cyst following endometriosis surgery. But it is not 100% endometriosis unless we've done a biopsy, mm -hmm. unless we've removed it. Yeah. Thank you so much for bringing this up for sure. Um, now we have two parts, okay? So I'm 41 old woman diagnosed with stage four endometriosis in 21. Following laparoscopic, I've had three fat embryo transfers. Now have low AMH. What would my options for fertility be? I should add, I had endometriosis cell removed from my belly button in 2017. Sure. Hi, Rennie, Peter. Hi, Rennie. Uh, okay, so yeah, scar tissue endometriosis. Endometriosis uh, is, is also a common common occurrence, as I mentioned in my slides. I'm sorry about all this uh, history. So I presume 
I presume you have no endometriosis now, or at least no obvious endometriosis, and I presume that uh, you have no serious symptoms. Um, so what are the options? I mean, at 41, it's normal to have low MH anyway, uh, related to the age, and of course, it's uh, expected and uh, reasonable to have low AMH in view of, uh, of uh, the previous history. So I suggest you press on with IVF. Uh, so depending on, on, on the number of oocytes or on the embryos uh, created, I would just press on. I mean, as long as you still create, as long as you still produce at least one healthy embryo, one normal looking embryo, plus or minus uh, PGT tested, I would just uh, keep on with embryo transfers. Now, various doctors have various uh, protocols as to how they perform the embryo transfer, whether they don't regulate a little bit longer or not, whether they use anti-inflammatory agents, whether they use steroids, whether they do it in, in a first cycle or in a frozen cycle. But I would suggest keep going as long as, long as you produce uh, eggs and embryos. All right. Thank you again. Okay. If you don't, or if you if you get to the limit to the, to, to the stage in which you've had multiple embryo transfers with no uh, success, then again I would move on to I would move on to um, egg donation. Thank you, indeed. Next one, a short question: Can endometriosis be prevented? Uh, as far as I know, no, unfortunately. Um, however. What I would hope is that um, with increased awareness, and awareness um, uh, is referred to both patients and doctors, we need to know more. Uh, even we specialists, we need to know more. Uh, we need to identify better, um, better individuals, perhaps, from other specialties to combinedly know more. Um, in my in my opinion, at the moment, I mean, the imaging aspect uh, needs to know more. Our fellow radiologists, uh, MRI specialists, ultrasound specialists, they need to know more. Uh, the geneticians, the gen genetics um, uh, uh, departments, they need to know more. They need to guide us a little bit more. Uh, so if we get to a stage where we all know more and... Um, Maybe we understand a little bit more about the etiology, about the pathophysiology uh, of this disease. Uh, we may be able to, if not exactly prevent it, at least apply secondary prevention or much earlier detection, much earlier diagnosis. All right, definitely important. Again, <laughs> this is something that still is in development, I would say, right? Um, next question from Natalie. I have endometriosis only on one ovary. I assume the other ovary is not being damaged by this. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, you can assume that. Uh, it it can, be, can be the case. I mean, the only way to find out is to, to, to carefully um, assess the situation through imaging initially and maybe laparoscopy. Uh, it is not uncommon. To, to have localized uh, endometriosis on one ovary. It's not uncommon to have superficial endometriosis only uh, presenting itself with, um, with, with an ovarian cyst. Now, with regards to ovarian cysts, which is um, one of very common presentations of endometriosis, all I have to say is that beware of ovarian cysts on young women. Uh, I mean, it's a long discussion, but I... I think uh, we all know too well that um, in the majority of Europe at the moment, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the access to ultrasound scanning, to standard uh, 2D inexpensive ultrasound scanning is not brilliant. And therefore, we have women managed by general practitioners um, who may be aware of endometriosis, but uh, they have no access to ultrasound scanning, which would be maybe after, uh, after the history and clinical examination, the first uh, primary care step um, for the diagnosis. However, this is not widely available, unfortunately, uh, in Europe. Um, I'm not familiar with other continents, 
but it's a little bit sad that in in, in Europe at the moment, um, in the public system, the access to scanning is, is so limited. So this is causing uh, the this is one of the reasons why there's a diagnosis of endometriosis. Um, a small endometrioma may not be a, a huge deal, a big deal, you know, for a young woman if it's diagnosed uh, early, if it's managed appropriately, you know, with very standard conventional laparoscopy, this can be easily managed. At the same time, um, the whole of the pelvis, the whole of the uh, of, of the abdomen can be visualized. Uh, other potential sites of endometriosis may be excluded. Uh, the patient can be very nicely educated uh, in order to, to, to take charge, to, to be in control of potential recurrences or relapses and so forth. So, yeah, if, uh, Natalie, if, uh, if you only have endometriosis on one ev- over and if this has been damaged timely and, uh, and uh, effectively, I think you can rest assured that you, you're fine as long as you keep on um, up to date with your follow-up maybe with your clinical and ultrasound follow-up six monthly to at least once a year sometimes uh, you can rest assured now if there's any doubts if there's any worries if there's any concern if you're i don't know your age if you're um, approaching to 35 or if you're older than 35 or if you want to do something extra then perhaps all site uh, chiropractic fertility preservation may be uh, an option for you in order to ensure that uh, you've kept your healthy young eggs uh, in case uh, these are damaged by either recurrence of endometriosis or or another endometriosis associated complication in the future. Thank you so much indeed. We will be slowly finishing, but I think we can still answer. This is kind of a longer question, but I hope you can have a look and see. Uh, from Maya. Um, so there is a lot of discussion of endometriosis and linked to autoimmune issues. Do you think someone with endometriosis age 35 with diminished ovarian reserve and low AMH recurrent plantation failure should have immune investigation and treatment? Or is there a value to lupron suppression before transfer? Told just wasting months doing suppression, giving, given time ticking with ovarian reserve, hysteroscopy is normal, no endometrioma, high cosy is clear, make good quality blastocysts with all new few eggs we managed to get. Husband's semen analysis is without any issues, endometriosis diagnosis, late teens, symptoms controlled well with medicated management, medical management, but seems more symptomatic every month now of medical management while trying to conceive. Now going through IVF past few years, main area near take nerve therefore decision not to excise sure uh thank you for sharing this maya um i agree with you with your decision not to excise um especially in view of the fact that um, i presume you have no serious um, symptoms or if you do have symptoms these are managed uh, conservatively that's absolutely fine um basically as long as you have good quality blastocysts i would just go on with the implantation. Yes, I would probably use lupo on suppression for a li- little bit longer than usual before the transfer. Um, the mechanism of this is to reduce local inflammation. Um, so yes, I would, I would definitely use that. Now, although there's no clear evidence, I would probably consider using a little bit of steroids as well in order to utilize the anti-inflammatory and, um, and uh, immunosuppressive effect as well so i think you're on the right track uh congratulations for persevering for you know i'm sure you know um your body more than any any of us would uh and uh just keep going if you have your blastocysts go ahead and have the implantations discuss with your doctors the option of uh, of longer suppression with uh, generate analogs plus or minus steroids all right. Thank you so much, Maya. And there's a thank you from Maya for you, Dr. Zekers. And I believe this will be our final question. This is from previous patient, right, from Kat. I'm 47, still hoping to be your IVF patient soon. I actually got my first ovarian cyst after an IVF session at 42 after social freezing. And I am on, I am on my mini pills to stop the cysts. Does overweight encourage endometriosis? 
Um, I don't know, <laughs> Natalie. I'm sorry. I, uh, I, I'm not aware of this association whether obesity is uh, associated with endometriosis. So I'm sorry I can't answer that. Now, um, if you've got your ovarian cysts after IVF, uh, I don't know. You know, sometimes, unfortunately, uh, stimulation, ovarian stimulation, may be associated with corpus luteum. And through corpus luteum formation, sometimes multiple corpus luteum, there may be the occasional hemorrhagic corpus luteum that may uh, resemble uh, the appearance of endometriosis. So unless we've had a biopsy, uh, we can't know for sure uh, whether it was endometriosis or not. So, um, yeah, I mean, if you've done social freezing at 42, that's amazing. And if you had um, good quality eggs, uh, uh, kept, I would suggest uh, uh, to not wait much further, much longer before you proceed with um, uh, with implantation. Now, I don't know what how overweight is overweight for you, but if you think you need to optimize your weight, just uh, seek for some advice from a, a friendly dietitian or a physician specialized in in, uh, in diet and nutrition. And once you have optimized your weight, uh, get on with your uh, Please get on with your implantation and hopefully with a good result. All right. Thanks again for this um, advice. One more question it is the final question. So I think we can still answer. Okay. So here's the question from Kat. I had a positive receptive test, but have no symptoms. I was told possible adenomyosis, but maybe endometriosis. I'm going three months of Lupron Depot and Letrozole. Would you recommend anything else before transfer? Uh, right. Okay. Uh, definitely, definitely his hysteroscopy. I would definitely suggest the hysteroscopy. Uh, now, uh, I mean, I don't know. In my mind, um, you know, although I, endometriosis uh, can be very tricky to diagnose with a scan, uh, adenomyosis is fairly recognizable on good quality ultrasound scans so it would be it would be valuable uh, if you could know what's going on um, in terms of adenomyosis or endometriosis prior to embryo transfer uh, if there is suspicion um, so on the other hand I mean three months of lupon yeah could be could be an option, but um, you know it's not without side effects. So uh, I would um, I would insist on the diagnosis. Cat, cat is my daughter as well. By the way, I love this name. <laughs> uh, she loves it when I call her cat from Katerina. So yeah, Katerina, try cat. Try to try to try to insist on making a firm diagnosis if possible. Um, you know, with good quality ultrasound scan. Uh, we can have an accurate diagnosis in maybe 85, 90% of cases. And if there's any doubts, even an MRI scan may be indicated. I mean, I would focus on the diagnosis before I went on a treatment because, you know, that treatment you described, yes, may be a good treatment option uh, if there is an endometriosis or adenomyosis. But on the other hand, I would not like it uh, in, in case there's, um, the diagnosis is not confirmed. And thank you so much. As I mentioned, that was our final question. So thanks everyone for joining. I do believe it has been useful. I'm glad we were able to talk about this subject. Uh, Dr. Tsakos, as always, it's great to have you. As you can see, there are thank yous coming up your way. Some comments, um, amazing thank you. No one has explained any of this to me, leaving me with a lot of uncertainty. Now I have a better understanding. Thank you so much for those uh, comments. Anything else before we finish, Dr. Tsakos? Sure. I mean, I'd like to thank everyone. I would like to thank um, um, the European Fertility Society for stimulating us and for getting this um, uh, this amazing team of specialists from all over the world. Uh, I'm very grateful to have been included in this uh, elite group. I'm very humbled and grateful for this. Thank you, Caroline, for hosting this webinar. And uh, Finally, th thank you all of you, all the attendees, all my patients from all over the world. Um, I must say that I've learned so much from them. I learn, I learn from you every day. I mean, today I learned so much from 
this wonderful Korean patient who traveled all the way from the U.S. and shared her experience with previous um, attempts and um, her feelings about, um, you know, how she felt she was um, stimulated or not stimulated or not adequately stimulated. You know, by talking to you, we learn as much as we teach. Uh, sometimes we learn more than we know, and I'm very grateful for that. All I have to say about endometriosis is that I don't think we know enough, but we are getting there. We, I mean, we know we don't know. So that's that's a good starting point. And um, if we if we settle with this, we will get to know more. Uh, we will get to to understand more, and then hopefully be able to help more and more of you to understand your condition if you have it, to diagnose the condition if you think you don't have it, to stage the condition if you have it but you don't know. The, the impact and the significance of it. Um, we have learned to, to work together. It's not a matter of getting the best surgeon. It's not a matter of getting the best robot, the best uh, hospital. Uh, it's not a matter of getting the best, um, uh, the best IVF specialist. It's a matter of getting the best team of people to, to, to sit down with you and read over and over again your notes, your results, the sequence of your results the sequence of your AMHs, the, the symptoms that you may or may not have. Um, we have to dig deep into what you feel, what you think is normal, and what you think is not normal uh, in order to identify how we can help you. So it's teamwork. Uh, the focus is you, the patients. I'm very grateful for all my patients all these years, and uh, I promise to, to keep serving them the best way I can. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. It's always great and a great pleasure to have you. So I know you will be back with some more webinars uh, next month, actually. But of course, uh, next week we will also will be back with some more. We will talk about implantation failure with uh, Dr. Esther Morban. So I hope you will be able to join us. Dr. Zakas, as always, it's been great to have you. Thank you so much for your time. And remember, if you wish to get some more answers from Dr. Zakas and his team at Embryo Clinic, uh, feel free to get in touch with them. I'm sure they will be happy to help you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, have a lovely evening and see you soon. Okay, Dr. Zakas as well. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Good night. Bye. Bye.